On today's show, Infiniti teases its new compact car, how GM is reducing the cost of fuel cell stacks, and what it takes to field a top-notch car show. All that and more coming right up on AutoLine Daily. This is AutoLine Daily for June 19th of 2015. Two years ago, Infiniti revealed a concept called the Q30, and at this year's Frankfurt Auto Show in September, the company will unveil the production version, the first compact car in its lineup. This car is still going through testing in Europe, which is where it will first go on sale at the end of the year. The company didn't reveal any other details, so we'll have to wait for more until it debuts. General Motors has significantly reduced the cost of its hydrogen fuel cell stacks. Charlie Fries, GM's director of powertrain engineering, told Autoline GM's first prototypes needed 80 grams of platinum to make the fuel cells work. Current GM prototypes are now running with 30 grams, and he says future vehicles will run with under 10 grams. With less platinum being used, Fries said the cost of platinum is no longer as significant. In fact, he mentioned there are currently more precious and expensive metals used in diesel engines. Currently, platinum costs almost $35 per gram, or slightly over $1,000 per ounce. GM has also partnered with Honda to develop next-gen fuel cell stacks. Honda's next production hydrogen vehicle is set to use GM's fuel cell stack in 2016. Although this has dropped the cost of hydrogen vehicles significantly, the hydrogen infrastructure and value proposition to customers will ultimately decide the fate of this technology. We'll be back with more right after this. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Borg Warner. Feel good about driving. Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Dow Automotive Systems. Breakthrough technologies for lightweight vehicles. And by Hyundai. Learn more at Hyundai.com. The average age of a vehicle in the U.S. is over 11 years old, but automakers are only responsible for the components in those cars for a decade, and that could explain all the defects we've seen lately. On AutoLine this week, David Strickland, the former head of NHTSA, says it's time to look at how we address this issue. How do we build prospectively thinking about how long vehicles are going to be on service, and when you have other problems with vehicles, sometimes it can be really bad problems like this airbag situation. Is it because of the vehicles are old and getting close to the end of service and you're going to be seeing more of these types of things? Or is it, you know, another reason for, you know, root cause? Because a vehicle out on the road suffering what it suffers on American roads and exposure and bad and, you know, bumpy, you know, bumpy asphalt and hot weather, cold weather, all this kind of stuff for 10, 15 years, we don't know exactly what the vehicle is going to do that far out, you can make your best guesses. And so this may be the beginning of actually reevaluation of our expectation policy-wise for the service. Right now, NHTSA and the federal regulations only require for a manufacturer to pay for remedy from 10 years of data manufacture. After that, if there is a recall remedy, the manufacturer could make the consumer pay for it. Why? Because the pen the number about 10 years is about right when a manufacturer really has that type of fiscal responsibility to the car. Is that the right number? I don't know. I think the Dakota situation brings that as a very fresh debate in terms of maybe we need a length of responsibility or maybe the answer is vehicle technology regardless how advanced it may be, there is a notion of unforeseeability and it's because it's an old vehicle and maybe we need to rethink of how we deal with those situations. It's, it's lots, wow. of, lots wow. of hard questions. Yeah, very hard questions. David shares a lot of great insight into recalls and NHTSA, so make sure you check out that show on our website, autoline.tv. And coming up next, you see cars that win blue ribbons at concours, but do you know how they got there? Each and every year, as prestigious car shows around the country get ready to kick off, you hear all about the 100-point stunners that will grace their lawns. But have you ever wondered how they got there in the first place? In the case of this weekend's Eyes on Design car show, 
there's a group of people called the Vehicle Selection Committee that's tasked with fielding the entrants. I got a chance to be one of those members for this year's show, and the experience was eye-opening. First off, if you're not aware, the Izon Design Car Show is unlike any other. Rather than focus on restoration and or authenticity, Eyes cars are judged on professional design criteria for both the interior and exterior. The hoods actually remain closed during judging. I'd been to the show before, so I knew what the layout could look like, but the rest of the process was completely foreign to me. It all started about eight months ago when an email rolled across my computer in late November asking if I'd like to participate. I figured why not? It could be fun learning something I knew nothing about. And less than two weeks later, I was sitting in my first VSC meeting. As a committee member, my main focus would be getting owners and their cars to the show. For a lot of the members, that simply meant scrolling through the Rolodex of contacts they'd obtained over the years. One of the guys, who clearly been doing this for longer than I've been alive, referred to possible entrants by their first names, like he just had dinner with them the night before. For me, it would involve a series of emails and cold calls. The theme for this year's show had already been set by the time I was on board. It's house style, which includes hundreds of cars that exemplify automakers' unique brand styles and celebrate the design leaders and staff who created them. I'd be working with the guy that recruited me for the job, trying to get vehicles designed by Elwood Angle, mostly Chryslers built from the mid-60s to the early 70s. It was a little intimidating at first, I must admit, but by the end of the process, I had a real appreciation for what the other members have been doing for years, and it was actually quite enjoyable. Everything the Vehicle Selection Committee does has an impact on the show, from how the field will physically be laid out to how many awards are given. You even have to know the flow of the entire show, so you can make the car owners feel comfortable and make it so they want to bring their car or another one from their collection back. And this is just one aspect of the Eyes on Design Car Show. There are plenty of other people volunteering their time out of the goodness of their hearts to raise money for a truly worthy cause. The proceeds will go to the Detroit Institute of Ophthalmology, which it uses for the research and development of technologies for the visually impaired, as well as assisting those people in their everyday lives. So if you're in Michigan and don't have anything going on this Sunday, head on down to the Edsel and Eleanor Ford Mansion in Gross Point Shores. It's a great experience for only $25. And who knows, you may even see the head of design at FCA, Ralph Gilles, roaming the grounds. He's this year's honorary chairman. Or maybe even a car you've never seen or heard existed before, like a De Tomaso Mangusta prototype. That wraps up today's show. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Wards is the industry leader for news, data, and analysis. That's why companies across the globe subscribe to our premium service, maybe even your own. Log in for subscriber access now. Check your company's intranet for details and rely on wardsauto.com to keep you informed.